and, and when a player would come into the clubhouse, <coughs> he would shoot this dart, and he would drive it into the molding, about two inches into the molding, you know, a couple of feet ab above guys' heads, you know, boom. You come in the clubhouse, and these freaking missiles are flying around. You could have been killed in there, you know? I used to worry about a line drive killing me, but not a, not a, not a poison dart in the neck, you know? <laughs> I'll never forget that. Oh, man. There was a huge uh, fan club for Ray Euler, who was a shortstop. And I am surprised he kept his job as long as he did because he was hitting in the mid-100s. And one of the things he had was a corked bat, which was totally, totally illegal. But he was probably so desperate to keep his job um, that he would do anything um, to do so. And so I was instructed, if that bat ever broke, that I was to get all the parts get it to the clubhouse as quickly as possible and no one was ever going to see that bat. I remember uh, a really hot, sweaty, you know, dirty game and we came in after the game and there was no, no water. There was no water. We were sitting around. When is it going to happen? Half an hour went by. They're still trying to work on it. They're still trying to get the water in there. So anyway, I, I take my uniform. I, you know, Steve Barber left the Whirlpool for a few minutes and I... <laughs> So I took my uniform off and I got into the whirlpool with a bar of soap. And the players were going, look at Boughton, for Christ's <laughs> sake, that's disgusting. Taking a bath, remember that? Taking a bath in the whirlpool. <laughs> anyway, I get all sedged up and I get rinsed off and I get out of the whirlpool and I go over to my locker and I'm starting to get dressed. And as I'm dressing and finally I you know, get my hair, and um, just as I'm buttoning my shirt to walk out of the clubhouse, I look over and I see a line forming at the whirlpool. <laughs> and then I remember uh, when uh, Goosen joined the ball club. I, I think Greg was a first baseman originally, but Minchard was over there, so he wasn't going to play any first base, and they put him in left field, and that was kind of an adventure. I was telling Greg last night, I said, I remember it was twilight, and, High, high fly ball to left field, and of course shortstop goes out after it, and I am keep, keep going, keep going, and I don't hear any, anything from Greg, so I keep going, keep going, and I'm out there by the bullpen somewhere, and I finally made the catch, and Greg's standing on left field like this. He never did see anything. So he says, well, thank God you kept an eye on it, kid. <laughs> So I, I'm in Seattle and uh, in a bar uh, talking to this young woman. I mean, just talking, no, no big deal. I felt sort of full of myself that I was, I was in the big leagues again. And uh, this is after I was called back up from, Milwaukee, from uh, Vancouver. And she goes, what do you do for a living? And I go, well, <laughs> I'm with the pilots. She goes, really? That's interesting. What airlines? And I said, no. The Seattle Pilots, the baseball club. And she had this blank stare in her face. And I just said, TWA. And she went, oh, that's good. You know, Merit Renew. Going to a lawyer, take the trouble to go to a lawyer and have a paternity suit drafted <laughs> against Fred. Now, Fred, I'm sure, was innocent, but who wants to win a paternity suit, you know? <laughs> So everybody in the clubhouse knows that this is a fake thing, and uh, you know, but they're all so they're all watching Fred, and it's so intimate. Of course, you look over there, and you know, somebody hands this thing to Fred. He opens it up, he reads it, puts it up in the top of his locker, lights up a cigarette. <sighs> Everybody's looking at him, you know. Puts a cigarette back in, reaches back up there, and he's reading it again. <coughs> It really is that, you know, wow, oh man, oh man. Puts it back, he finally gets up and he walks out of the clubhouse and we don't know where he's going, but as soon as he leaves the clubhouse, uh, you know, Tommy Davis said, uh, you know, I, I didn't think you, I don't think you white guys could get any whiter. <laughs> when the Yankees came to town, a famous fight in baseball at second base, our shortstop, Ray Euler, 
and Thurman Munson running from first to second, sliding into second base. Euler, Munson, Tangle, start a fight, benches, empty. Ball players all over the field. It was great. I had, a, um, I guess, a reputation for staying out and, and once in a while drinking too much. And my guy I stayed at the Ramada Inn with was a guy named George Burnett. And George was an old-time ball player, you know, left-handed, gritty guy. And uh, we're, at the end of the year, not at the end, but a couple months before, Dewey Soriano, the owner of the Pilots, throws a party. You know, out in the blue. So we're going to a party. I, I'm getting dressed, and George, he, he comes over to my place and he goes, Now, Goose, uh, you're doing well right now, and you gotta, you got to be careful when you go in there. You know, you, we're going to go in there, and we're going to have a couple drinks, say hello, Mr. Soriano, Mr. Milks, hello, and leave. You know, just, I'm doing this to protect you. You understand, Greg? I said, sure, okay. Okay, he's an older guy, and you respected older guys. So we, we take George's car, and we drive to the party. And uh, we're having a couple of drinks, and I look over, and here comes George with Marvin Milks in a headlock. He goes, now Goose there is hitting the ball well, ain't he, Marv? And Marvin goes, yeah. He said, well, give him a raise. How's 15,000 sound? Well, oh, think about it, George. <laughs> Here's a guy, we'll have a couple drinks, so he lets him go. And I go, George, what are you doing? You're killing me. And I go, oh, don't worry about it. George has had a couple of drinks. <laughs> and uh, he's gone now, so I can tell the story. But all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. And... and uh, there's this cab driver that goes, uh, who called the cab? There's still a lot of guys in there. And George goes, I did. I said, George, uh, we drove here. He goes, I know. Just take my word for it. And he came with him and he gives the cab driver, I don't know, 30 bucks. And he says, drive to Ramada Inn. I'll follow you. I forget how to get there. <laughs> So there's thousands of dollars ready and waiting for lucky fans. Keep on listening. If your name is called during the home run inning, you can collect over $1,000 for a home run or $25,000 for a grand slam homer. The very next home run could have your name written on it. Well, you know, I just happened to hit a home run in the seventh inning one particular game, and, uh, uh, and I think I won a, a fan like $5,000. You know, and and lo and behold, that fan uh, sent me a check for ten percent. Sent me a check for five hundred dollars, which I thought, my gosh, this is unheard of. You know, well later on in towards the end of the year, Fred Talbot, pitcher for the Pilots, gets up with bases loaded, hits a grand slam in the seventh inning, and wins this fan twenty five thousand dollars. Fred starts off down to first base, and before he hit second base, it was decided in the bullpen that Fred should receive a telegram from Donald Dubois, <laughs> thanking him for his prodigious effort and uh, promising him $5,000 <laughs> as a token of appreciation. <laughs> so since that was my idea, I had to go to the telegraph office the next day and have a bogus telegram made up and uh, the genius moment was when I, uh, uh, dear Mr. Talbert, I misspelled his name so that it would seem like a real telegram. Anyway, so this gets put on a stack of mail in front of Fred's locker, and of course everybody knows it's a, you know, it's it's phony. And anyway, we're game goes, we play the game. We're now on the bus to the airport because we're we're heading for a road trip, and Fred's. Fred's been having a little secret smile all day long, you know, because he's got this telegram. So he's sitting on the back of the bus, Ray Euler sitting next to him, and uh, Fred says, uh, hey, Ray, take a look at this. <laughs> Ray looks at it, of course he knows what it is, and he says, uh, 
Well, uh, what, what if it's one of the guys playing a trick? And Fred says, nah, if it was one of the guys, they wouldn't have misspelled my name. <laughs> I hit the last home run in Pilots, and I wanted to stick around the clubhouse and, and enjoy that moment. We didn't know we weren't going to be there, but we knew the season was over, and it was a crazy-ass season, and uh, let's enjoy this, have some beers uh, before everybody disperses. They wanted us out of that clubhouse. They weren't washing anything. They weren't washing towels. They were shoveling it in big carts and taking them on these van lines outside the stadium. Little did we know these van lines had pulled up during the game. We didn't know what was going on, but they didn't want you. They wanted. They were trying to hurry us out of there. Get the hell out of this clubhouse, and so we can pack all this stuff up. So we're wondering. But two weeks before that, or three weeks before that, there was thing in the paper that we weren't going to get paid. They were having a hard time even making payroll. So now it all started coming together. Van lines are out there. They're shoveling all this stuff, and we're. I mean, I'm sure all of us kind of figured, what's going on? Yeah, I go home. The next year when we went to spring training, uh, there was rumors around, you know, that the club was struggling and, and, and I, you know, it wasn't until late even in spring training we really knew that we, we were planning, you know, I had my stuff uh, still in Seattle, you know, from the year before. I was single at the time and I had left my stuff in Seattle to, to come back here and was looking forward to it. So all of us went to Tempe, Arizona again. And before it was official and became the uh, Milwaukee Brewers, we were into spring training games. And Jimmy Dudley and myself had to do the games as the pilots for a while. Then that day came when it was official. And we, I believe it was four games as I recall, we broadcast as the Milwaukee Brewers. Now that was tough to take. And then when spring training was over, and they were going to Milwaukee, Jimmy Dudley and I were going back to Seattle, there was no ball club. I obviously wasn't very sophisticated in the ways of sports business back then, but it didn't seem to make any sense. Uh, I had read stories about the, the travail, financial travail the team was in, but I didn't, it just seemed in, uh, uh, unconscionable that a, a, a major league uh, operation would move a team after a single year and so I kept in my you know mind about being a fan I kept thinking this can't be that they're not going to do this after a year give it a chance for gosh sakes no it really wasn't a surprise we had a, a terrible feeling that it was going to happen it was a sad time for the city of Seattle it shouldn't have happened I'll be honest with you I was crestfallen I, I couldn't believe it uh, We'd worked so hard to get Major League Baseball in Seattle. Well, I, I, I feel, I feel like it's just kind of a sad, sad thing that happened. You know, I uh, there's no reason that team should couldn't, or I say should, uh, couldn't have stayed here forever. And, and why not? It's just I, I, I have, I wonder, you know, what they were thinking about uh, to put a, an organization together like that with with, with no money. I felt sorry for the fans. They were anticipating Major League Baseball for the rest of their lives up there, but it didn't work out. And of course, a few years later, Kingdom was up, they get baseball back again. But I enjoyed it immensely in Seattle. Broke my heart when they moved. I do remember that it was, it was weird following the Milwaukee Brewers and seeing those guys' names in the box scores. And I remember seeing pictures of them in those uniforms and going, that's not fair. If the success had been based on my father's enthusiasm, they'd still be here. I mean, he, it, he was so enthusiastic about it. And I, I think Uncle Max was as well. It didn't work out. You know, it didn't work out. But it wasn't a scheme to unload it and make money on it. I mean, that, he would have much rather had them here. Much rather. I was devastated when I found out the team was leaving because I never got a chance to go to a game with my dad. It was one of those, we'll do it next year type things 
and there was no next year. We were so much younger It always seemed to be summer And one more game to play But somewhere the truth caught up The truth is we were brought up Just a, a marvelous collection of guys. Uh, Fred Talbot, you know, Ray Euler, uh, Don Mincher, these guys were just fantastic. And because they were from all different teams, they were playing together for the first time, and so they were getting to know each other. So they were all telling each other their stories. So as a writer, I was able to get all the great stories from the Minnesota Twins, from Don Mincher, <coughs> the Boston Red Sox stories from Gary Bell, the Detroit Tigers stories from Ray Orlo, the Kansas City stories from John O'Donohue. It was as if somebody put this team together and said, well, they're not going to win many ball games, but if somebody writes a book, this is a hell of a ball club. I always saw Jim with this notebook in his left hip pocket all the time. So we're talking, I said, Jim, I said, you're always taking notes. I said, don't tell me you're going to write a book. And he says, uh, Sean, as a matter of fact, I am. Every time something funny would happen in a bullpen, he'd pull out a spiral notebook and write it down. He said, oh, that's hilarious. I said, well, why are you writing it down unless you're writing it? He said, oh, I just want to make sure I remember it. I said, nah, you would remember it. I had no idea what he was doing. I knew he took a lot of notes in the clubhouse. He captured the sheer immature funniness that draws you to the game. I mean, grown-ups don't do that stuff. You know, grown-ups don't do what he mentioned in the book. Because one thing, uh, there's an old saying, uh, you have to grow old, but you can stay immature all your life. And uh, we did, it was just uh, maybe a way to relieve pressure, but it was that the greatest thing about baseball, you could be 30, 40, and act like a 16-year-old. I don't know if that's what people dream to do, but it was something we did. And I found it just an absolutely hilarious and wonderful look at the, in, uh, at the inside of baseball. And of course, it caused a huge controversy because it was not treating baseball with the reverence that it had become accustomed to in both literature and in daily journalism. And Jim Bouton's book, I think, changed a lot of things about baseball and the way the media covers it. And so, from a standpoint now as a professional, I think it was a landmark event. Ball Four was such a seminal work, not just in terms of sports literature, but just literature in general. And, you know, really the first uh, sports book to humanize and demythologize the professional athlete and give 
you know, the reader a look behind the scenes and see what their daily life was like. It was revolutionary at the time. It seems a little more benign now when you, when you read it. But at the time, which not coincidentally was a time of you know, real social upheaval in the country, uh, to, to have this, it really opened a lot of people's eyes. And of course, all of this would be meaningless if not for the fact that it was extraordinarily funny and just a, a wonderful read. I thought uh, from a very academic standpoint, I thought Jim was extremely accurate. I think he was extremely uh, personally emotional about his feelings towards the people he was talking about, the Mickey Mouse of the world and, and his issues because Jim was a very savvy individual politically and uh, business-wise. I enjoyed it. You know, I was there for most of the things that he wrote about and I didn't think they were so bad. There were some wives that I didn't care for it on occasion. It was the 60s. It was irreverent. It was exposing stuff that wasn't talked about before, but nonetheless it was real. And I think to try and hide the realities is, is not all that good either. So Jim got a lot of flack and a lot of heat, but in reality, probably the people that got in trouble <laughs> were the ones that earned the heat. He's injected a lot of things in there that were and inflamed some things that weren't really all that significant, but you know, to make it fly, you gotta do that. And uh, I don't blame him for writing the book. What the heck, he, uh, he's a, a nice gentleman, I think, and a nice guy, but a lot of the players don't think very highly of him anymore. But uh, he, w he was never a problem to me. The only problem he presented to me was, as I may have mentioned, is that he used to hang around my office a lot because he had, I think he had his eye on my secretary. And, um. I know when I went up, he didn't think I should have went up, but uh, you know, but no, the book really, I think that's what really made the Seattle Pilots well known is, is the book. And you know, he did do a good job. I mean, there were some guys that didn't appreciate it, but yeah, you know, that's life and stuff, so. When the book did come out and uh, we were both back in AAA at that time, uh, he was on camera and uh, I just proceeded to tell him uh, what he could do with each page of the book. Um, and that's not because of me. Uh, as far as Dooley Womack was concerned, I didn't really care. Uh, I didn't like the uh, idea of uh, cutting Mantle and Ford down. Uh, I'm, I'm one of these, well, I'm a Mickey Mantle uh, fan uh, admire him, uh, still do, regardless of what he did on the field or off the field. Many more of the goings-on on the Major League Baseball team that do influence game outcomes and seasonal outcomes are reported much more aggressively than it used to be before Ball 4. And certainly the background that Boughton talked about with the players, um, you know, habits and wanderings at, at the in night, it, it's all now sort of an accepted understanding by most fans and the breakthrough event was ball four. Forty years ago, there was a major league team here, a major league team that lasted one year, the Seattle Pilots. There's a reunion here. There is Jim Bouton, uh, the knuckleballer, throwing out the first pitch here on this beautiful evening. Nice to have the 69 Pilots here. Even if you weren't born then, even if you've moved to Seattle only recently, the story of this thing is still fascinating, and it's still, I think, from those people who are have been here, who have those memories, there's a, there's a certain affection for that period in Seattle sports history. So I think it would be embraced even if you weren't uh, alive or around or aware of the pilots at the time. I think this part of Seattle's history 
is a worth is, is worth revisiting. Uh, I get probably three to four uh, requests for autographs a month, uh, and you know by pitching only one inning in the big leagues, it's uh, it's kind of an honor to know that there, you know, people out there still care. Uh, to talk to people, yeah, they they do remember the Seattle Pilots. You, you get people that send you uh, letters and asking for autographs, and most of them it's about Seattle. I remember. Well, they remember better than I do, but you know, it, it's 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 nice to be part of an organization that is remembered that way, even if it is for one year. If, if they can think back and say that, you know, I remember seeing you play in Seattle or whatever it was, or if it was Minnesota, and they're asking for autographs. God bless them. That, that that's wonderful. Well, you know, I think basically because it was just a one year. You know, I mean, even though the franchise moved to Milwaukee. It was, it was, and then I think uh, Boughton's book, Ball Four, I think, you know, came in and got some interest to the fans and it, it kind of put it in the spotlight. Of the, of the, the my autographs, I, you know, I don't get a ton of autographs, but I get, you know, two or three uh, fans, you know, sending uh, cards to sign, and Seattle Pilots is the, is the big card. You know, that's the collector's uh, 